our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you for all that you are in our lives, who you are, and all that you've done in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given us to study your word, to think about it, to talk about it, to meditate on it. Oh, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. Please filter out all of that which is ignorant, but just seal to our hearts only the truth of your word, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in this uh, amazing book of Revelation. I uh, wanted to report to give you all an update on my health uh, issue. Uh, been to the doctor. Uh, I had an MRI. They are there are no signs of uh, cancer. I had uh, that's wonderful news. I had two issues that I was facing. One was a prostate issue, and one was uh, getting hit on the head with a four by four that fell on top of me as I was doing some construction around the place. It was a treated four by four. And I didn't think much about it at the time, but it had caused some problems uh, in uh, in my head, as if I need more problems in my head. So they gave me uh, a drug. Uh, they gave me an IV, and they gave me a pr prescription uh, for small oral doses to be taken over a period, a two-week period. It's supposed to reduce the swelling in my brain. Uh, it may cause some, uh, uh, they said that it may cause some dizziness, some headaches, and some uh, blurred vision, which it has. And that has uh, somewhat set me back here. But, you know, despite all of that, just the hunger and the thirst for, for understanding uh, his word uh, has not been interrupted. And so we will uh, continue on with this, and I'll deal with this. The Lord is in control, and He does all things well. So I may, may be back to normal in a, in a few weeks uh, with a, a little bit of a bumpy road along the way. So I ask you all to continue uh, in your, with your prayers for me and Sue and for the direction of this ministry, uh, as always. We love you all. We truly do. We've been uh, looking at chapter, we had been looking at chapter 17. We're now in chapter 18. If you remember, we had a, we had a heavenly messenger, an angel that, that came to John and he said, you know, I'm going to tell you the secret of the woman that was revealed in verse five. And we know from verse five of chapter 17 that her name was a secret. Her name was Babylon, the great mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, and that name is a secret. And so we have a messenger come in verse 7 saying to John, I'm going to tell you that secret. And the rest of the, the 17th chapter is, is him telling John the secret of this woman. The uh, announcement of verse 18 was that this woman is the great city of Babylon. Now, I know it doesn't say Babylon in verse 18. It doesn't say that in any translation that, that I've found. And I've looked at, at quite a few. Uh, and I've pointed out that many think this uh, verse 18 refers to Rome. Uh, some think that it refers to Jerusalem. And then there are the, the strange characters like me who believe it's mystery Babylon. In fact, this, uh, this heavenly messenger, he says, the woman you saw has a name, Mystery Babylon. There's a secret connected with that name, but her name is Babylon. So it's a city. It's clearly called a city. Uh, she has daughters. She's riding a beast. Both the woman and the beast will become the objects of God's wrath, both will be defeated along with the false prophet. 
I believe that chapters 17 and 18 are uh, two chapters that ought to be studied together, that they are prophetic, their future. I believe that there's, it's speaking of the destruction of a city, a literal city. And that city's name is Mystery Babylon. Now, about seven and a half million people live uh, on the site. Uh, well, not on the site of ancient Babylon today, but, but within that area. Uh, if, if you looked at the population of Baghdad, about seven and a half million. So it's never been totally destroyed, as these verses here say that it's going to be. So given that it is a mystery, to suggest that this is uh, Baghdad really removes the con whole concept of it being a mystery. Uh, at least that's the way I'm looking at that. I believe it to be a literal city, but I don't believe that we're looking at Baghdad, is, is my point here. The woman is riding a beast, which is an evil world system of government headed by Satan and a man that we know uh, will, will arrive on the scene, the Antichrist. Uh, but the harlot has daughters. She's the mother of harlots. And religion factors into this. Religion has to factor in because we have a false prophet. Now that, that the uh, this ancient city of, of Babylon uh, is mentioned, it's uh, for a fact we can't ignore the fact. Uh, I can't, at least I can't ignore the fact that it is a literal city. Uh, there, there's there's a lot of uh, talk about well you know restoration you know the like. As Saddam Hussein was trying to restore, you know, Baghdad, Baghdad, uh, primarily for tourist reasons, but uh, I don't think that uh, restoration is the word that we ought to be looking at. We know that this, uh, we, we know this from from what is said of it in chapter seventeen and eighteen, mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Chapter 18 speaks here of a city, a literal city called Babylon the Great, that the woman and the city symbolize the same thing. It's clear. Understand this. The woman and the city, they have to be the same thing. Uh, 18, 1 through 3, Babylon the Great has fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies the woman is destroyed by the ten kings that's back in chapter 17 while the kings of the earth here in chapter 18 uh, bemoan, bewail, lament uh, her uh, uh, destruction, uh, the destruction of the city, 1716. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. And then 18.1, after these things, after these things, that is, after the destruction of the woman, the city itself is destroyed. The woman and the city share the same identity. The ten horns, which we know are ten, king, ten kingdoms with ten kings, that did not at this time exist, they combined, they, they, they unite to destroy all other religions which the woman represents. Now, isn't that exactly what the Antichrist would intend to do? But that's not good enough. We see here at the beginning of chapter 18 that a city called Mystery Babylon, the Great, is itself destroyed. The woman's name is Mystery. 
Babylon the Great. Paul calls the church a mystery. Well, you know, where have we heard that, that word mystery before? Well, Paul calls the church a mystery because it was not known in the Old Testament. It wasn't known by the Old Testament prophets. Uh, that Christ was to have a bride. That, that was first revealed to Paul. And the mystery uh, that Antichrist is to have a bride was first revealed to John here in Revelation. The name of Antichrist's bride is a city, Babylon the Great. It's called a city. Okay, I find it interesting that the same angel that showed John mystery Babylon the Great, th that same angel comes to him in chapter 21 and he says, Come hither, I'll show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife, which he also calls a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. A city that is called a bride because its inhabitants, not the city itself, the inhabitants are the bride. Therefore, Mystery Babylon, the great, the bride of Antichrist, is not uh, uh, to be seen just as, as merely a one literal city, even though I believe it is. But it is a religious system. Just as the bride of Christ is made up of, of us, the followers of Christ, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Bride of Antichrist, will be composed of the followers of all, all false religions. Uh, it's interesting how that the, uh, to me it's interesting how the geographical location of literal Babylon, I'm talking about today, has a connection to the Garden of Eden. Uh, it has a connection to the Flood. It has a connection to the Tower of Babel. You know, Satan, no doubt, favored this particular historical, geographical uh, site. Uh, Babylon was built by Nimrod. It was the location of the first great apostasy. But the city of Babylon continued to be the seat of Satan until the fall of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, the fall of the Medo-Persian empires. When he then shifted his capital to Pergamos in what is today uh, modern day Turkey. The Antichrist, it's clear, the Antichrist comes out of Turkey. Uh, any serious Bible student of prophecy would surely come to realize that the Antichrist comes out of Turkey. There's too much evidence that he, uh, other, you know, that he, did, too much evidence uh, to to miss that, seeing that the Antichrist he won't permit any worship that does not center in himself. He'll destroy all other religions, which is what the great harlot represents. But of course, the Antichrist we know is the master deceiver. He's the father of all lies. He's not going to, and this is my opinion, he's just not going to uh, create some already existing uh, uh, other religion other than uh, the one religion, the one religion, just one religion. It's not, I, I'm not saying this very well. I, don't, I do not believe that the Antichrist will uh, establish a religion in, in which... Uh, other than the greatest religion that will exist at the time that the Daniel 70th week begins. When the rapture occurs and Christian Christians are gone, uh, Christianity being the number one religion, I've pointed this out before, uh, the number two religion, the, the second largest religion is Islam. And it's not just the size, but the fact that, that it's the second largest that I believe factors into this. But uh, there's a, an enormous amount of evidence to support the idea that Islam has uh, connections to a, a system, an evil 
religious system, which, you know, I got, I've got to, I'm, I simply must try, you know, start exercising a little more, uh, or putting forth a little more effort to not care about, about being politically correct here. I'm, I'm simply trying to make the point that, uh, anyone who has really studied this religion in light of scripture knows that it is Christianity's counterfeit. Now I've done a number of videos on that. A lot of other people have, have done that too. And what makes this difficult for me is that there's so much to talk about. There's so many dots to connect. Uh, there's so many pieces to the puzzle that it can become confusing even even to those who, who I believe who diligently set their mind toward trying to sort it all out. But I believe that when we the more that we look into this, the clearer the picture becomes. The Antichrist will not permit any worship that doesn't center in himself. He'll destroy all others. Which I believe is, I believe that's what this great harlot represents. So the woman riding this beast is not the Antichrist. Okay. The, the, the ten horns, kingdoms, kings, which we know are the ten horns are kingdoms with kings. They do away with all, uh, all these other forms of worship by the direction of the Antichrist, where the woman is said to be sitting over peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. But now in chapter 18, verse 1, we see that Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That cannot be Baghdad. You know, since the ancient city of Baghdad was destroyed, it's, it lies in ruins. I mean, you could say it's going to be rebuilt. It could be rebuilt in, in a day, I guess, if, if everybody pitched in and, and gave it their best effort. But I don't believe that's, that's what we're looking at here. I believe that it must refer to some future city of mystery Babylon. We, I think we m much too often skim over the word mystery Babylon. The, the two chapters refer to different things is, is further verified by the fact that they are announced by different angels. Babylon was probably the most uh, magnific uh, magnificent city that the world has ever seen and, and is mentioned in scripture more than any other place on earth just about if not holy um, an enormous number of references to Babylon in scripture may, may even be mentioned more than Jerusalem I, I, you know uh, I would I would put my money on the fact that it's mentioned more than Jerusalem. It's mentioned a lot in the description of the destruction of the city of Babylon given in this chapter. We read that her judgment will come in one hour, and that in one hour she'll be she'll be made desolate. A mighty angel took, takes up a stone like a great millstone. He casts it into the sea, saying. Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Uh, we're also told that she is to be destroyed by fire. And the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah cannot be fulfilled unless there is to be a future Babylon that is destroyed. I don't see any evidence for this city being Jerusalem. I don't see any evidence for this being Rome. I don't see any evidence for it being the location of the ruins of ancient Babylon, 
for Baghdad. Back in chapter 16, uh, we were told that Babylon would be destroyed by an earthquake, lightning and thunder. Uh, it would appear then that just as Sodom and Gomorrah were set on fire and then swallowed up by an earthquake, that the rebuilt city of Babylon, if you want to say call it rebuilt, I don't want to call it rebuilt. Uh, this mystery Babylon will be set on fire and, and the city, like a millstone, will sink below the surface of the earth into the sea, uh, swallowed up so that, that, that it'll be impossible to ever take, uh, the, uh, take the stones uh, for uh, rebuilding, for using for building uh, other structures. And the land will become a wilderness where no man will ever dwell. I take this as not a uh, anything but a an evil world religious and economic system that will exist at that time, and that uh, the actual geographical location of this literal city. Though it, though it does represent uh, this world religious and economic system at the time, I think the time will come when Mystery Babylon will be recognized, not rebuilt. And that that city today, as I've suggested, I believe, and I don't ask anybody to agree with me, I believe that that is Mecca in Saudi Arabia, near the Red Sea. It's the location of Islam's holiest shrine, uh, says that at this time it'll be the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The city will be the uh, the seat of the greatest blasphemy, I believe, that the world has ever known. Not just at this time, but even today. For all that we could say about Rome or, or New York City or America or United Nations or, or you know, you know America, you know, or uh, Jerusalem, no city, no city comes anywhere near such a description as does Christianity's counterfeit Islam. Now, of course, there's two factions of Islam. Uh, there's Sunni and Shia. Uh, I've talked about that. Uh, I believe that factors into this too. In that day, demons, unclean spirits, will find at this mystery Babylon, this city, the opportunity of their lives. They'll come from the, the atmosphere, the heavens above. They'll come from the abyss below. They'll come in, in countless legions until Babylon is full of demon-possessed men and women. And at the height of its glory, and just before its fall, it'll be ruled, governed by Satan himself, incarnate in the beast, which we, we know as the Antichrist. We also know that before its destruction, God will mercifully deliver his own people from that place. Uh, uh, for a voice cries from heaven, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, her, that is, her wounds, the wounds that she's going to receive. Uh, just like Sodom and Gom Gomorrah, just, you know, like they couldn't be destroyed until... Uh, righteous lot had escaped, so Babylon can't be destroyed until all the the righteous people in it have fled. The destruction of the city will be sudden. It'll be without warning. A uh, great and terrible, fearful storm will sweep over the city. Lightning, thunder, great thunder, lightning. The city will be set on fire and a great earthquake will cause it to fall. And Babylon will be no more. But Jerusalem, it ain't going nowhere. 
So I suggested that the religion of Islam and the city of Mecca would factor into this and that according to Old Testament prophecy, uh, we know uh, today, we, we know that 90%, 90% Shia in Iran, uh, there's 90% Sunni, just the exact reverse in Saudi Arabia. And I've suggested Iran would destroy Saudi Arabia. That's Old Testament prophecy. Uh, Iran's working now to get to uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, they hate, Iran hates the, uh, the worldly Islam, you know, in, uh, in, uh, kind of looks at it as, as not the ecclesiastical form of fa faction of Islam, but the, just the worldly Islam. It's all about power, struggle for power and control, though. Just like anything, it's always about that. So, uh, the Lord tells us that the nations are deceived and they, and they will be until Satan is chained for a thousand years where that he, 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 uh, he's, he's loosed then and he deceives the nations once again when he's loosed from those chains at the end of the thousand years. But in our present text, the nations are deceived. The nations are deceived. And one of the great deceptions of the, of, of, of the, uh, Antichrist, uh, upon the nations is, uh, It's a government that has no desire, no interest in God, any other God but this man who will claim to be God. You know, I've, I've had people email me and say, Steve, you think this is all about, you know, Islam and, and the religion of Islam and, you know, and the Antichrist is a Muslim and, you know, and I even had one write me, a dear brother in the Lord, he wrote me and he's, he was just uh, wondering, you know, how the, the Antichrist could uh, be of Islam when uh, the Muslims themselves believe that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Why would he? they accept uh, some man as being uh, to govern over them? Uh, It's, uh, I think it's easy to forget just how masterful a liar and a deceiver Satan is. One of the greatest deceptions is that there's no God. And without any doubt, there has always been a drive among the nations of the earth to have one a one world dominated government the idea being that you know well if we were just all ruled over by one government and one army well then we wouldn't fight ourselves you know so we'd have everlasting peace and harmony and, you know at least that's the theory today we're seeing world leaders embrace this globalist idea and you know, you know we have for a long time what i what i find disturbing what I find unheard of in my lifetime here in the United States is, is you know, this all-out war being waged by one party to eliminate the other from the election process entirely. You know, it, it, would, it would just be a marvelous society if we could just get rid of patriotism and, and the individual concepts of national, uh, nationalism uh, and just have one world, one group of people all living together in glorious harmony. It's always been the dream of men. It started in the case of Nimrod at the Tower of Babel. They didn't want God. They didn't need God. They were going to build a city, establish a name, and they didn't need God. And that's been true down through history. Many a world leader wanted to be that one dominant figure. A lot of Antichrist wannabes. 
One of the great deceptions of Satan among the nations of men is they don't need God. Man can be the captain of his own ship, the controller of his own destiny. You know, kind of like the, you know, the direction modern Christianity today has taken. You know, that views man's will as the determining factor in all things. Man is sovereign, not God. You know, amazing. I believe that day is coming sometime after the rapture when we're gone where it'll be much easier to do all of this being that there's a tremendous restraint today among those who know and love the lord and have a little bit of common sense but the day will come when it'll be much easier to establish such a government and we're not asleep to this the world as a whole is asleep to the fact that the stage for all of this is being set. The pieces are being moved into place. We can see that. The stage is being set. People in general today have just become acclimated, you know, like the sort of like the frog in the pot of water, the boiling pot. They, they we, we get used to we just get used to the changes and the events. The, that occur in our lives and we soon forget them you know it rolls across the ticker on the t on the on the news screen and then it's quickly forgotten I don't, I don't think too many people are keeping journals you know of all these events and so we just gradually become used to it we don't retain it all in our memory it's probably impossible for us to do so but, but most people aren't, certainly, they're not connecting the dots. They're not seeing what's going on. And I believe that we can. You know, many of the things which uh, people have, uh, have just become part of what people regard as normal progress, you know, or, or things that are history, you know, but mostly things that are considered the norm, you know, it's, it's, a, it's progress to have no desire for God. You know, it's progress to, to want to have uh, uh, world peace, unity. 9-11 is history. Though the uh, attack was M Middle Eastern centric, you know, forget that. Forget the fact that, you know, and forget the fact that in a very real way it sort of flipped the switch on all this forget the fact that this power struggle in the in the Middle East is ancient and it goes back to Cain versus Abel and Isaac versus Ishmael and and Jacob versus Esau etc forget all that that's ancient history you know if it even happened at all you know space exploration that's normal you know all the thousands of years that man has lived That's normal. And it's vital. It's vital for the continuation of the species. The UFO phenomenon, well, it says man doesn't need God. As does, you know, uh, all these technological advances and, and artificial intelligence. I mean, what's the death of Main Street got to do with any of this? Okay, but we've forgotten about that. If you've forgotten about that, drive down your main street in your town sometime as a reminder of the fact that, uh, well, I just think that all factors into everything. But we, we tend to look at that as just, well, it's progress. Online commerce, electronic transfer of funds, that's all progress, right? Government com corruption, well, that too is progress. At least it is nowadays. It's for the greater good. You know, the end justifies the means. Uh, increased hatred toward Christians, uh, Israel, Jews, Christians. That's progress. Satellite TV, progress. The indoctrination of our youth, not the education, but the indoctrination. That's all progress. Respect for elders out the window parental restrictions the thing of the past family deterioration that's progress in the minds of many of the elites
Entertainment. Uh, that's another form of indoctrination. Nothing to see here except just stuff to f tickle your fancy. All of this is a normal progression of the species. The, the enormous, how about the enormous number of, of translations, denominations today? That's a good thing, right? Reaches a lot more people. Yeah, it reaches them with what? Divides us, for the most part, if you ask me. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Steve, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, how about apostasy? More progress. It's all about world peace, unity. You know, we stand in the way of all that. That's the reason the world hates us. The world has its reasons for not wanting Iran to go nuclear. But it has to, according to Scripture, according to prophecy, it has to. But to the average person watching the news, that's just politics as usual. We're awake. We know what's going on. I mentioned that uh, Islam has two factions, Sunni, Shia, you know, who even cares what the, about that, though? I mean, you know, it's hard enough to understand Republicans and Democrats. Turkey, well, that's just a bird we eat on Thanksgiving. Syria, Damascus, uh, too far away to care about, really. The Ottoman Empire, boring history. Now, the world is asleep, but we're not. We're awake to what's going on. We aren't living through these verses we we're studying. We're not living here. We're not in this. We'll never step one foot inside Daniel's 70th week. We never will in the bodies that we inhabit. But it's all coming together just as God said it would. I believe that these prophecies are going to be as literally fulfilled as those were in the Old Testament. You read Jeremiah for, for just a little while, and you'll think you're right here in our present study. Sounds like essentially the same language. Chapter 51, Jeremiah 51. The nations are drunk of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Jeremiah 51. Uh, uh, Babylon is sudden suddenly fallen and destroyed. And that single verse has caused a tremendous amount of debate. Was Babylon suddenly destroyed? Well, you have a great number of Bible students who say, well, absolutely. Belshazzar had a feast, and in that night, Babylon fell. I suggest it didn't. The Persians liked the city. Cyrus thought it was a great place. He established his throne there. Many hundreds of years later, it was still there. Revelation 18, she is made desolate. It's never happened. That has never happened in human history. It wasn't true of the destruction of Jerusalem. That three or four year period never happened. I believe there's going to be a literal city that's going to fall in one hour. The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast shall hate the harlot, make her desolate, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her, says Jeremiah chapter 50. It shall be no more inhabited forever. That's never been true. This is future. With violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and found no more at all. So it looks to me, and I'm not asking anyone to agree, just think about it. It looks to me like what Nimrod tried at the Tower of Babel, the Antichrist can't do unless ancient Babylon is rebuilt, which seems to me to be highly unlikely. Satan deceives the nations into giving their power to him. We were told God put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. So here's a man establish, establishing a one world government until a difficulty comes. God declares that they're going to do exactly what he ordained to be done, just as they did in the crucifixion of our Lord. They gave their authority to the beast for that period of time to do what? To do what? To destroy mystery Babylon.
We looked in chapter 17 at the delusion. They've been led astray into what they think is something very attractive. God likens it to a harlot. You can call it false religion if you want. You know, any any a world government dominated by man and ruled by man is a religion. But there can be no other religions. The question is, why would the Antichrist betray his own system of Islam? The answer is that the Antichrist will rise to power through that system, but then once he has power, he destroys the system. Hitler did the very same thing. Hitler came to power starting out by being a chancellor, and then when the president died, he then combined the two positions together. He, then ha he didn't have any need then for any parliament, so he dissolved that. So it will be with the Antichrist, and God uses the Antichrist to accomplish his purpose. You know, it's the snake, folks, eating its own tail, rising to power through the system to then destroy the system, which guarantees his power. Therefore, in my opinion, and again, I don't ask anybody to agree with me, he has a reason then to move his capital to, guess where? Jerusalem. Because his goal is to take Jerusalem from Israel and declare himself to be God. God using Trump in the moving of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem was a very important picture for us, dearly beloved, because it is a setup for what will one day take place. We won't be here, but be warned, God is against all that Babylon represents. Okay, you know that the enemy is called the accuser of the brethren. We, we need to be careful not to be the accuser of the brethren. We're called to build up and edify. Let our words be a blessing. Make sure that you don't do that because that's God's heart, to build up and to edify. These channels that put you down and weight you down, blame you for your sins and blame you for this and that, and, you know, lordship, salvation, and, you know, this legalism, even to the slightest degree, law, when you've died to the law, We've died to the law so that we might bear fruit unto God. Satan's the one that criticizes. He's the one who reminds people of their failures. He's the one who reminds people of their shame. There shouldn't be one preacher behind any pulpit doing that. I took it back to Hitler. It, it goes, really, actually goes back to the serpent and Eve Paul writes, what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. You know, don't grow weary, as we read in Revelation chapter 2, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. This woman made the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication. And now's the time to decide what we are going to drink. If you're looking for a modern day, you know, present day application, you know, we need to decide now what we're going to drink of. And of course, that can only be one thing, the living water. This book, God's Word. The kingdoms of earth are made rich by this evil world system, mystery, Babylon the great, but we hold the things of this world loosely. We don't fix our heart on material things. In the last days, the false prophet arises and he causes many to worship the beast. It's not just political, but religious. That's why there's a false prophet and an antichrist. So this system looks good. It looks very, very attractive. The trouble is, it doesn't last very long. It becomes less attractive until finally they turn against it. We see in the ten horns that turn against her, turns out to be false hope. The Antichrist deceives the nations. As a result of their being deceived, the nations turn against the Antichrist. You know, Albert Einstein, brilliant mind, you know, he had a tremendous desire to help bring in world peace. That's what he wanted. Idea, idea you know, was that you know, well, if we just developed a strong enough weapon, uh, a weapon so powerful, nobody, nobody would ever dare go to war again. You know, we'd have, we'd have peace. 
He felt that if we had a good weapon like an atomic bomb, we'd end war forever. And later, he testified before Congress, the Congress of the United States, pleading that we wouldn't develop a more serious weapon. He was convinced that, that, that such a weapon would destroy human civilization. I take it that he never read the book that we're, we're looking at here. It's not going to happen. It's, it just can't happen, and it won't end war. But he thought it would, and Congress laughed at him. He died a few years later, and I think, folks, he died of a broken heart because he wanted to end war, and he had a dream that this atomic bomb would do it, and his dream was no good. And frankly, I think it destroyed his life. That's what's going to happen here. These people have the dream diluted by Satan and by the design of our sovereign God who sends upon them a strong delusion that their government will solve all man's problems. And I believe that headquarters is going to be mystery Babylon until it's destroyed or that he then moves into Jerusalem where that in the process of all this chaos, you know, cities like Damascus and, you know, being destroyed and all the rest of it, where that a, a nuclear Iran is involved, as well as most uh, Arab nations trying to, to resolve the age-old conflict between two seeds, you know. And that it has nothing to do with uh, Italians or Europeans or, or, or Oklahomans or Texans or, or you know. For, and you don't have to agree with that, folks. But that is what I believe. The 18th chapter then is simply a continuation of this destruction of that system, that, that woman, that city, and everything that that city represents. I think the 17th and the 18th chapter reveal how deceitful that that plan, you know, of man determining his own destiny is, which is by the, amazingly, that is the very heart, folks, of legalism today. But that's, that's another video. Ruling the nations, all in peace and security. That's very attractive. Looks like a harlot. The result of that being that they turn against it because that dream is a false dream. They've been seduced. Same is true when it comes to legalism. People are seduced with cleverly devised fables, says Paul. You know, even legalism can be attractive. But, but like in the case of what we're studying here, it won't provide everlasting peace. False doctrine. We're told to give heed to doctrine. False doctrine is the habitation of devils, the hold of every false spirit. It is a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And any other gospel besides the one true gospel is especially a doctrine of demons. God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. He, you are elected, you are, you are redeemed because he died in your place. You've been justified, you've been made righteous, all because God did it. He did that. You didn't have anything to do with it. Nothing. The truth is you were redeemed because Jesus Christ died in your place. How are you born again? By the will of God. How were you born physically? Well, I, I sat around for a while and I looked at different people and I decided I like those two over there to be my parents. Come on. You know, as a sister of the Lord told me once, the baby doesn't say push. You are redeemed because Jesus Christ died in your place and that's it. If you believe that, that's a wonderful thing. If you trust him, you have the peace that passes understanding and the joy that's unspeakable. There's no doubt you will come forth as gold. I don't care how desperately pathetic that your life looks. You will come forth as gold because he said you would. He said so, and he doesn't lie. He's directed your steps. It's not in man to direct his steps. We see the same lesson here in our present text proven on a grand scale. I'm glad God directs mine and yours. I pray every day, Lord, I, I don't care what happens. I'm yours. Do with me as you please.
and then a tire blows out, and then I ain't got a lug wrench. You know, and I think, you know, if I don't trust him in the little things, I wonder if I'd ever really trust him in the big things. Now listen, dearly beloved, I believe that God is working in every one of you to will and do of his good pleasure. If he died in your place, you can't, you cannot, you cannot die. You're new, a new creation in Christ. And what did you do to become that? Nothing. You were born again by God from above, by the word of God. That's redemption. But when you trust him, you're delivered. Take heed unto the doctrine, for in doing this you'll deliver yourself from, from trying, from law, from effort, to peace and rest in Christ. You'll deliver yourself and them that hear you. Well, I'm out of time. I'm going to have to stop it right here. Uh, thank you all for your prayers. I pray for you all constantly. Thank you all for all of your love, your comments, your prayers, your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.